Are you overwhelmed and stressed? Do you have so many decisions that you make regarding care for your elderly loved ones that it seems impossible to figure out? Well, you're not alone. Year after year, the demand for senior care ever increases. But how do you make good choices? What if you had someone like Dr. Amandita Johnson? They're basically, I help families find assisted living, independent living, mm. Uh, memory care, in-home care, home mm -hmm. health if they're needing home mm -hmm. health. It's free to the families. That's cool. So you get that surprise a lot when they say it's your. It's yes. Free. They're like, "What's the catch?" Like exactly. Yeah. In this podcast, we're gonna walk through how a senior advisor can help you make informed healthcare decisions for your loved ones. Hey everyone, this is Charles with Charlene Health Services. We have a special guest, a dear friend, uh, Amandita Johnson. She's a certified senior advisor with Care Patrol. And so thank you so much for thank hanging you. out with us today. Thank how's, you. How's your day going so far? Great. Yeah? Yeah, great. it's been a great day. Nice. Awesome. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Well, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about yourself in general and what got you to becoming a certified senior advisor. Yes, yeah, so I am a certified senior advisor with Care Patrol, and um, I cover the Northeast Dallas area. And um, being a certified senior advisor, basically, I help families find assisted living, independent living, mm -hmm. uh, memory care, in-home care, home mm -hmm. health if they're needing home mm -hmm. health. Um, and we tour to assisted living places. We actually do the violation histories. We, we examine quite mm -hmm. a bit of mm -hmm. it before we recommend something. And um, it's free to the families. That's cool. So do you yeah. get that? Do you get that surprise a lot when they say it's your? It's yes. Free? They're like, what's the catch? Like exactly. Yeah. And sometimes they ask us like, so who pays you? I said, then I tell them, of course, we're transparent about that, that we are paid by um, the providers who mm -hmm. contract with us. There's thousands of them mm -hmm. uh, in the nation. We have national contracts and local contracts. So mm -hmm. they pay us basically a finder's fee. Wow. But we spend a lot of time with families. We handhold them throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Yeah. What, so walk us through the like a process just in general. Say for instance, you, you meet with someone who needs placement. What does that look like? What is the family, like how do they reach out? What does that right. process look like? So there are different sources of, um, of basically our referrals. Mm -hmm. We may uh, encounter a call from our website mm -hmm. and sometimes it's from a hospice company mm -hmm. or a skilled nursing facility, a home health mm -hmm. or um, somebody from a community, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. And when they call us, we sit and basically talk to them. We, we would like to have an in-person discussion first, mm -hmm. but sometimes it doesn't happen because a child may be out of state or mm -hmm. um, you know, somewhere outside of where, where we are. And so we talk through uh, some of the care needs and then we sit down and do a lot of research, mm -hmm. of course, to make sure that the care capability of an assisted living or memory care matches with um, the care needs. Gotcha. And then uh, we give them options. And so sometimes we might give them six to 10 options. Wow, that's good. But we have to narrow that down because not everything will fit their lifestyle, their their budget, yeah. the location, yeah. um, and we tour with them. Wow. So what are some yeah. of the difficulties you see when you're giving a family like those six different options? Like what are some things that you see families ask a lot of like like questions like I'm mm -hmm. sure budget right I'm sure that's the first question maybe or budget mm -hmm. is is a question um, the size of the room mm -hmm. amazingly because half of our clients come from homes yeah and so they are worried that mom and dad would have to give up quite a bit of the things those prized possessions and so we do walk them through that and it depends on the situation if there's a history of falls, mm. then we convince them to have a smaller space because mm. the bigger space you have, the more likely they're going to have to go around furniture and things with their right. walkers or wheelchairs. And right. so there's a lot of education and sometimes their focus in the very beginning changes mm. as we're touring because mm. we, we talk about care quite a bit. Mm -hmm. 
and yet um, there may be other medical needs mm. that we didn't get to discover in the beginning and go, oh, we forgot to tell you, dad also has this and that. Wow. So yeah. then that changes. That pivots the course mm -hmm. a little bit. That pivots it. Um, medications, for instance, and how medications are delivered. Mm. So, for instance, there, there might be some diabetics uh, who have sliding scale mm -hmm, mm -hmm. injections, and mm -hmm. not a lot of assisted living will take right, those. So, right, right. Um, it's nice to have the care discovery, a full care discovery from the very beginning. And so, what we usually do, if they're coming from skilled nursing or home health, is we try to get the progress notes ahead of time. Okay. And I, I'm the only one on the team who yep. will read those. Um, uh, my team members are great with working with clients and all, but um, they feel uh, that I could, I've read thousands of medical records when I was yeah, in health yeah. insurance. So yeah. they feel like I could really go through the process thoroughly yeah. and understand the, the language. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we go through that and that makes it a lot easier because the family sometimes don't, didn't even know. Yeah, have no idea. Right. Wow. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. so, so you mentioned health insurance. Walk us through like what got you be to becoming a yeah. certified senior advisor. So I, it was not part of the original plan. Okay. I was four and a half years from retiring from health insurance. Wow. Yeah. So I wanted to retire at 55. Okay. And that's a good, that, that sounds great. <laughs> I, I thought, you know, I've saved quite a bit yeah. and I'm going to finish my doctorate and um, go off and go back to academia. I used to teach college mm -hmm. and that was not, I would say that was not the Lord's plan yeah, because yeah. Uh, my mom went through an illness and mm. um, I just had a change of heart, honestly. I still love my old workplace, yeah. but I had a change of heart and um, decided to help families mm. go through that difficult process mm. of being there for their loved ones. and. Um, so when when I became a CSA, uh, I really had no idea what I didn't know. Mm. So it's it's one thing to spend 17 years in healthcare insurance and understand diseases and and claims and cost of care, but it's another thing to really understand what an old older person, mm. an older adult, is going through. So in uh, the CSA world, we look at the journey of aging. Um, communicating with older adults, mm -hmm. elder law, mm -hmm. estate planning, okay. yeah. uh, their insurance like Medicare, um, quality of care, chronic conditions, state programs. Those are just a few of yeah. the things. Yeah. There's several textbooks and we have to take an exam hmm. to be a certified senior advisor. Wow. But what that also means is now I have a better idea of what to do with people who are going through dementia. Hmm. And it's so powerful because you know, dementia is not the same for every person. Yeah. And I thought yeah. you could just stratify well, who has Alzheimer's, who has vascular dementia and right. all that, but that's the clinical part of it. The symptoms are different yeah. and yeah. the socio, uh, the behavioral stuff's yeah. different. Yeah. So um, wow. it was great yeah. to to get the, the certified how long did senior that take? I was just curious, how long does that process take? You know, I studied so, I was working full time. I was doing my doctorate full time, wow. and I was studying the CSA for three months. Okay, wow. And then I, uh, of course, passed it, and not fully confident that I would pass mm. it, because I want to say that the the content of the certified senior advisor is about equivalent to three doctoral courses. Oof. So people don't know that when you take this exam, you're not just pulling concepts out of your head. Right, right. It's it's very much like case studies and you got to answer right. according to the concepts the you've learned and the yeah, scenarios yeah. you've learned. So um, they're very situational and, um, but I, I don't have regrets getting it. Mm -hmm. It was difficult um, and I do encourage people who, even if they're realtors or financial advisors, 25% um, of Americans, right, are going to turn 65 by 2030. Yeah. That's one that's in four people. Yeah, that's a lot. So you're most likely going to uh, encounter somebody who's older. Mm -hmm. And getting that CSA just gives you um, a, a great base of how to really deal with older adults. Mm. So, well, Question, so like if someone is thinking about, you know, becoming a CSA as well, what's some things that you learned in the field that they 
that you didn't learn while you were studying or taking the exam? What are some things that you learned, like just in general? Just yes, there is one mm -hmm. that wasn't touched on quite a bit, which is the family dynamics. Ooh. That's a big deal. <laughs> so, yes, I think if you're a psychologist and you've had clinical training and depression and yeah. anxiety and um, what family dynamics is about, that's one thing. But I, there is one tool that I have had to learn mm -hmm. a lot because I'm by heart a teacher mm -hmm, and I mm -hmm. love to talk all the time, mm -hmm. is the power of listening. Mm. And the, the second tool that I've had to pick up is to suspend judgment. So mm. when you're working with a family dynamics, there's one part where you're advocating for the elderly and the other part where you're having to be there for those who are taking care of the elderly. Right. And part of that is they they sort of, not intentionally, but they will sometimes pawn you off against each other. Yeah, yeah. And so my mom's like this, or my daughter's like this, and, and be on both sides. You yes. can still be on both sides yeah. in that family dynamics and still serve both equally mm. and not uh, really Have give biases judgment. or take sides. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and sometimes I use humor yeah. in front of the daughter. Yeah. Um, I We will banter about mom in front mm -hmm. of mom, mm -hmm. but you're making it light and they can, they need that yeah. because they're both in crisis. Yeah. And it's really difficult for a senior to um, give some of that control mm. to a person that they've raised. So true. So yeah, family dynamics true. was one that I thought I had to really learn. learn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's also hard because, you know, we come into a family's life for a little small second. We have years and years of maybe good, good stories, bad stories, drama, and then we come in there and insert ourselves and I like that, like the power of listening, right? And then listening, not suspending judgment. judgment. Suspending. That's really cool. Um, it's hard. Yeah. There are some lifestyles that I wasn't used to before I came into this, mm. and I've had to understand um, that there's that's their lifestyle. Yeah. Um, there are some things, for instance, that you might encounter some clients who are sexually violent. Mm. And what do you do when you're in the room with them alone? Mm. You know, there's like some strategies that I had to employ. Mm. Like I would put my heavy bag against the door so that um, I can still talk to them Whoa. and joke around yeah. with them, but know that I'm in a safe, yeah. safe place. Um, yeah. I mean, that doesn't happen all the time, right, but right, right, right. the textbook does not. Doesn't say that. <laughs> Teach doesn't <you> say that. <laughs> be, care like, be careful when you go into the room. <laughs> exactly. That's you know, true. and I carry some things in my bag yeah. that to protect yeah. me. And I also go to people's homes. Um, but for the most part, um, it's been a really great experience. And mm. being even the family dynamics and having to learn from that. Uh, teaches me a lot of lessons, mm. I think, the whole uh, nature of people, mm. uh, that academia or yes. pushing papers didn't teach me. And yeah. I've been to a lot of leadership classes, yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, still learning. Yeah, yeah. Those, those soft skills, being able to understand or have tone, the right tone, the right body language, and all those things. Because then they're like, is this person really listening? Do they care? You know? That's crazy. Oh. I'd like to be an expert in that someday. Yeah. Still. You do a pretty good job. <laughs> thank you. You do a pretty good job. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So if you're watching this, thank you so much. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe this video. It helps, I think, the algorithm a lot. And uh, I hope this helps and educates you well. So. Let's keep it moving. Yeah. yeah. So, so walk us through, you know, some of the challenges that you see when you have someone who's looking to be placed. So say, for instance, someone is going to, needs to go to a rehab or they need to go to a skilled nursing facility. They need therapy. What are some things in that world? Let's talk about rehab and skilled nursing that you're really helping families to look for um, specifically in that transition. Yeah. So... Uh, understanding their coverage is important okay. because I, I try to be proactive even if they have original Medicare that I know they could have 90 days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 
they're at that advanced stage where they're not going to get a whole lot, mm -hmm. even with aggressive therapy. Okay. And there's also a component there. You know, skilled nursing right now is short staffed. Yeah. And so they might feel more depressed as the weeks progress. Yeah. So knowing when the timing is, timing is important, right? Mm -hmm. So knowing when is the best time um, to recommend to the family that discharge date will need to happen sooner. Mm. I don't get to influence that. I'm just trying to tell them, okay, I've been to the rehab three times. Yeah. I've talked to your mom and there's been, uh, it's been harder for them to get up mm. instead of getting better, mm. yet they're getting five days of therapy. So there's also an emotional and mental component yes. to that. So if we change settings and they are in a happier yes. environment, then maybe this is the best way, which just happened to, I mean, it happened this week. Mm -hmm. So Being able to see that my client couldn't stand anymore. Mm. And then we moved her to assisted living and two weeks later, now she's in and out of the car with aid. Wow. So that's progress. That's really neat. So it's hard to sometimes explain that to families yeah. when it's their first time, yeah. but it may be my 30th time yeah. Yeah. of observing these things, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and good. then when it happens, you can't really say, well, I told you so. <laughs> They'll be like, what? Amandita? <laughs> that's part of that suspending the yeah. judgment is they still True. get to make the decision and True. you can't really shake your finger and yeah. go, well, I told you so. Wow. So, so the coverage part. So as you're talking to families and they're thinking, okay, my loved one's going to be here um, for how long? I think a lot of times we get questions and you probably get this a lot is, what does the insurance cover, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of a skilled nursing facility, mm -hmm. and sometimes they hope that's like insurance would cover AL, but you know that's not even the mm -hmm. case. So, how do you help educate families through those differences between AL or IL or going to insurance? Right, route? that's actually common. Yeah. So yeah. many of them will call and say, "Well, she has great Medicare coverage," yeah. and. And I, I tell them that assisted living and memory care right. do not cover, right. um, I mean, uh, they're not covered by Medicare. Yeah. So um, I think that there is a lot of education that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, one, assisted living is a fairly new industry. Mm. It only started in the 80s. Mm. So our elderly today who were in their 80s and 90s still think of assisted living as a nursing home. Well, my mom's Medicare covered the nursing home or whatever coverage it was, right. and it's different now. Right. So we do. I, yeah. I tell them, I'm sorry that you know they don't cover that. Yeah. Um, but there are so many other ways now um, to cover different needs mm -hmm. without having to even move into assisted living, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, they could qualify for certain things. They can. They could have a life settlement that's mm -hmm. against their life insurance. Um, if they have long-term care insurance that mm -hmm. could cover assisted living. Mm -hmm. um, if they're a veteran, they could yeah. possibly get some pension, mm -hmm. additional pension. So we, we go through those questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the beginning, I didn't know there were going to be a whole lot of veterans. But then we started exercising that mm. whole, where you a veteran spouse, where you a veteran, where, them, you know, yeah. we're now asking those questions all the time. Wow. And there's so much benefit. And a lot of times veterans, they don't have someone to walk them through the process or they'll call the VA and no, no offense to the VA, but it, they're, they're busy sometimes. Mm -hmm. And they're able to walk families through those little steps. Mm -hmm. And you, that's what you guys do a lot. We've so. sat down, we've actually had to call, um, there are some veteran benefit planners mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we actually call right then and there. And oh. then they're going, oh, it's that easy. and. So cool. they just need to know resources sometimes. Yeah, and yeah. it's it could be as easy as texting them a link. Yeah, true. Yeah, or it could yeah. be as um, involved as us being there. Or, or like one of our consultants would be in the nursing home um, or rehab center and actually sit down and they would call right then mm. and there. So we can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. to walk yeah. families through it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like they, especially our senior population, they need that help, you know, to just like walk families through those processes. So. Yes, and then depending on where they are, 85% of seniors actually have a phone. Mm. So 
a lot That's of them true. can maneuver that. The problem is cognitively, can they handle that conversation? And sometimes if they've fallen and they just went through, you know, you know this post-surgery and they're under a lot of medication, yes. mm -hmm. they can be confused. They, it's hard to even understand some of them. So um, we, we have to aid them through that. Yeah, so. that's tough. That's tough. So now let's talk about the not the coverage. What's another aspect? You mentioned clinical needs. So mm -hmm. how do you walk families through what clinical aspects they need or how do they age safely in place in other in other places as well? Right. Mm -hmm. So if um, they are at home, I think the hardest thing in my experience is mm. when they have refused to see a doctor in the past mm -hmm. three to five years. So we really try to talk to the family about giving dad a ride and getting him seen because yeah, yeah. we have to have a baseline. We have to have something and some kind of blood work mm -hmm. so that we know where they're coming from. And if they have fallen and they're going to need PT services, and that doesn't mean they're going to have to be moved because right. when they refuse to move, I, I'm a proponent of 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 staying mm -hmm, home, mm -hmm, of course, mm -hmm. unless it's not safe anymore. And having that visit to um, the doctor is important yeah. because then yeah. you can get your your um, your PT orders done, mm -hmm. you know, and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. we just know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, if it's coming from a rehab, um, I try to ask for the progress notes ahead mm -hmm. of time and so I can see where it is and we have a conversation with the family like I know you said that your mom can take four steps but the right. progress note says they have a hard time just getting right. up so things have changed since and so we walk through that um, sometimes I work with social workers mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. kind of see okay this is where they're going um, and here are their needs hmm. right and if they're no longer rehabilitative, like they have to be discharged, for instance, with dementia, right, right. then we know we may have to either go to hospice, you know, or talk to the family mm. about something like that. Wow, wow. So. And that's tough sometimes, isn't it? Having those conversations. Yes, yeah. I try not to make it difficult anymore mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I might cry if I make it difficult. <laughs> we all, yeah. <laughs> but I always start by saying it is hard for me to say this, but and it it doesn't have to happen today. Mm. But these are the signs, and you will have to watch out for these signs. Yeah, and then at that time, start thinking about hospice. And this is this is mm. why I'm saying it. Yeah. Hospice doesn't mean it's for actively dying. Right, right. If your mom no longer can be rehabilitated, which means hospice gives habilitation yeah. for the person. Mm -hmm. And there's been so many instances where they live longer. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I can count, yeah, like, yeah. you know, I mean, I can yeah. tell them stories yeah, after stories. Yeah. Well, they get better, actually, sometimes. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's exactly. The quality of life is important. Yeah. And, you know, Polypharmacy is a huge problem. You talk about clinical things, that's another part of it where when I see somebody who has two, three, four conditions and they have 15 medications. From, from 12 different doctors. As, yeah. Yes, with so many different specialists, but nobody's really looked at the, yeah. the entire gamut of their care. I start coaching the, yeah. the family on what to ask. Yeah, yeah. Because this three medications came from the hospitalization two years ago, they're but their blood it. work says they shouldn't be, you know, I, I think I know enough to be dangerous to mm -hmm. coach them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then sometimes I could be wrong. Yeah, there may be yeah. other things that were not right. quite documented well that, you know, was a reason yeah, why they're in, in certain, but it's good to ask the right questions. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. I have, I've, Curious. So, have you ever helped them? You probably have, but just I just want to know from my own information. Sure. Have you ever um, basically walked a family through some like a senior who was kind of having some maybe oriented times three, maybe two, and they needed placement, but their loved ones were out of state? How does that process work? If you like helping them through that process, I've had a few of those. How's that? Yeah. How does that work? <laughs> Huh. It depends on where they are, right? If if they cannot 
to work with me and they're in an, a skilled or a rehab mm -hmm. place and um, daughter sons in both like other sides yeah. of the country um, I pretty much one a communication is important I think yeah. so it's it's a little bit more difficult but it's easier mm. because sometimes when they cannot see what's going on mm -hmm. their emotions are a little bit outside of yes. so you're able to talk to them objectively true yeah whereas if you had three daughters that or children right there and they can see and and each of them have a different opinion hmm. of what mom should have yeah. that's a little bit difficult so sometimes i'm okay with it wow. because and especially when these are reasonable you know when they're reasonable human beings it's it's easy to talk right, to anybody right. anyway even if they're in person right. but what i do is i go in and i record you know their i give them the options and they pick from that mm -hmm. and i go and tour and i'll record it for them oh wow. and i'll have an interview session with the um the representative of the assisted living and it's like they're there. I ask them a list of questions. So what do you do when, when mom falls? Do you call 911? Is there a button? What is the response rate? Uh, I mean, we go through all of that. All of that, and that's recorded for mm, the family. It's recorded for the family. That's pretty cool. And then I've had to do that with relatives who are in Holland, mm. right? And the loved one was here. So wow. then they click on a link and they can watch this video of the tour and listen to the conversation. Wow. And sometimes I might get an email that's two pages long <laughs> because somebody's a thinker and yeah. they have all these other questions. And then I make a phone call and we answer those questions. Mm. So, um, you know, we spend about eight to 10 hours per client. Wow. So in this business, you can't really turn it to where you're just going to make a whole lot of money because yeah. you're going to see more people. No, um, you have to delegate some of that. That's why we have some help, right, with people who will tour and take care of families. Mm. Um, I'm not giving that up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if, if it means we have to spend 15 hours with a client because it's a little bit com complicated, then so be it. Yeah, because yeah. we know that there are some clients who are only going to need three hours of our time. Yeah, true. They're pretty independent. True, yeah. I love the independent yeah. um, clients, by the way, because they want to move. Yeah, yeah. They're, so. they've, they've, they've realized, okay, it's time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's good. That's good. So those are actually kind of, that's interesting because those families who are out of town, sometimes it's actually smoother than sometimes those who are here and you have... Uh, uh, two siblings that are feuding at each other and fighting like family feud or something. Mm -hmm. and how do you deal with that? How do you deal with those kind of situations when there's just nobody's agreeing? Well, first of all, I don't believe any of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. There's always a side to every story. Mm. And I wish I could just delineate who's saying the right thing or who's not saying the right thing. Most of the time, there's things that are meshed in between. There's some truths and, everything. and there's some exaggerations and there's some things that I didn't know in mm. between. And and here's such a great question, by the mm. way. I mm. love that question because mm. I'm still learning this <laughs> part of it. I'm not a psychologist, yeah, so yeah. it's fascinating to me. But it's sort of because I'm a marketing major, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with marketing. Mm. Like you really don't know. Yeah. Even with this target market, what makes them tick, right? Mm. So... The most important thing I think is understanding what their needs are for each of those and being there for them, mm. for the client, of course. Mm. And then for the son who is who is more focused on the financial part right. of it, right. for this daughter who's more focused on the clinical and the care, right. for this daughter who doesn't want to be part of anything. No stress. <laughs> I'm right, already right. stressed, got two kids in college, doesn't need any more stress. Exactly. Yeah. It's that person who just sits in a corner, don't want to be engaged. Right. So feeding every need mm. is, is really important. And, and I don't have to please everybody, yeah. right? Yeah. Because I can't. Right. But at least they know that I'm there for all of them. That's neat, yeah. Addressing each of their concerns. Absolutely. Through the whole process, yeah. And it's always like that. <laughs> every single day. And there are some who don't have children. Now yeah. that how does that work? That is probably one of the hardest things that mm. I think emotionally I am all about connections and 
and I wish there's somebody for them, but sometimes a neighbor could come. Sometimes I have to coach them to go to uh, adult protective services, mm. um, encourage them not to take guardianship because that's oh. a difficult process for even for an elderly as yes. well. Um, sometimes they listen, sometimes they're like, no, I can do it. I'm like, well, good for you, good mm, luck. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are a lot of folks here in this area who didn't have children. Mm. Um, and and thankfully we have great neighbors mm. who, Certainly. and friends. Yeah, Texas has some good neighbors. Yes, yeah. and I had one who- And they'll mow your lawn too. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I had one, both of them had dementia mm -hmm. and um, it was like far, like south of where I live, and I would go and pick her up to visit her husband. We did that three times. Wow. And so she would call me because she thinks I worked in the memory care. Oh, wow. So it was kind of funny. And so I actually had to ask a relative to go to her and take my name off her phone and replace it with the memory care. Because <laughs> she thought you worked there. Yes, and just oh, put my name, but yeah. it's actually the memory care. Yeah. Wow. So um, wow. Uh, that that happens, they didn't have children. And um, I think that's, I mean, it is the saddest part as well, not because they didn't have children, but um, I don't know who to talk mm. to at times. Wow. I have to wait for the process to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I do I do lose sleep sometimes mm. because especially if they fell asleep outside a garage in the mm. middle of the night and because they forgot their keys and then the cops have to pick them up and and you know I think sometimes people think, you know, adult protective services are for those who are kind of the lower part of this society mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. no. Yeah. No, there's abuse happening even yeah. in people who are well off yeah. and um, there are people who are neglected who were engineers and yeah. have three million dollars in the bank and yeah. I mean that happens with anybody Everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. it wow. can happen to us yeah it's true God that's forbid really true. <laughs> I know. that's so true that's so true what are some of the when when someone meets you for the first time what are some of the like the most common questions people ask a CSA like what do they usually ask you like when you're there to help them, what are some things that just say like, okay, I'm Indita. This is my first question. Like, what do they usually say? They don't usually know I'm a CSA. Okay. They yeah. just think you're a friend, a good friend with a smile. Well, they just, um, they just need help. Mm. And I usually don't even talk about myself. That mm. first hour is all about them and the problem. Okay. And then they realize, wow, she just listened to me for an hour mm. without saying much. And then they start asking a question about me and, mm. and I say, um, you know, I understand I've been doing this this long, um, still learning, but I can tell you I will be here. I will be here. My hours are nine to nine. Mm. But if you're if you can't sleep and at ten o'clock you wanna call me, just mm -hmm. call me. Mm. I'm still awake. Mm. Yeah, we're not we're not <laughs> So I'm just there as a friend, yeah. really. Yeah. When they know that um, I'm a CSA Maybe that's important to them after the fact, but when in the middle of crisis, they're just so focused on their loved one or yeah. or themselves, um, and that's okay. That's really yeah. Good. yeah, yeah. What are some things that you would advise someone that is going preparing to maybe meet with you or someone that is a certified a senior uh, advisor? What were some things that you would want them to like ask? Good questions that they should ask. Um, what's going on? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I love that question because how may I help you is like jumping ahead mm -hmm. of solutioning. Mm -hmm. But what's going on, there's usually a trigger that happened. Mm. And then just sit and listen. And they'll, they'll, just let them talk and yeah. just write notes. Yeah. Sometimes I have three pages of notes Yeah. that probably are not needed, but, but I just want to yeah. know. And I think this is one thing that I have not been good at and I'm learning is know who they are. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, we are in the, this crisis. They are not walking or whatever it is they're going through or they went through surgery. But there's something that's an underlying uh, problem as well. Like get to know those and get to know who they were. Mm. So people who have dementia, who've had dementia for eight years, the family knows a very different person. They do, yeah. Sometimes they see that person as a burden, not not in a bad way, but they are my burden, they're my project, they're almost like my child. Yeah. 
I'm taking care of them, but who were they before? Because they're going to remember those. They are. Yeah. So every time I talk to somebody with dementia, I talk about what they used to do, and they love to talk about yeah, that. Their occupation, their hobbies, their, their favorite foods, mm -hmm. what they like to cook. That's true. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. That's and great. I kind of, in the very beginning, I was so focused on solving their problems that I didn't get to ask those questions, like, who were they? And then mm. I forget, mm. right? And then... I've met with them three times and I'm like, oh, um, what what did your, you know, and it's like, I should have asked that in the very yeah, beginning. Yeah, yeah, creating that, like a, a good foundation. Mm -hmm. That's good, that's good. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So when it comes to like advising a senior and you already like know what kind of facility they need, what makes you choose this facility would be better than other? Do you prioritize like quality of care or like what would make them more comfortable or like a mix of both? Yeah, so there's a lot of factors. Um, first of all, their condition um, is important. If we're talking about somebody who has those, right? Um, I think that the location from the loved one is like my second mm. focus. If if budget, I mean, budget's already qualified, right? If that's not even a, a, a big issue. And within a certain budget, we have about four to six options anyway. Um, I think that it's important to also find out if they can age in place. And I want to talk about that a little bit mm. because aging in place is such a um, misconstrued phrase. Mm -hmm. And most assisted living will say that, and they mean to, but the senior living industry have different staffing mm. standards. So that has a lot to do with what type of um, co company they are, what their value system is, if they are all like for profit and we have to have this much census all the time, um, this is how much staffing we can afford. That doesn't always mean they can age in place. Mm -hmm. So where they are in that gamut, the continuum of care, if they are, um, if they are in kind of that advanced stage and they have all these health issues, I will have very few options for the family. And my intent is for them to be cared for there and they're going to stay. Because it's hard to move somebody who's got a lot mm. of issues, right? Um, now, a healthier person who is going to go into a, a continuing, uh, you know, what they call like three levels of care, they might have the intention to age in place there. But I tell you what, when somebody then starts to have colostomy bags and feeding tubes mm. and dialysis, which you can't really predict, that changes things. Hmm. And that doesn't mean they're going to be able to stay there. Mm. So it's kind of a long answer, but it depends on where they are. Hmm. That's a really good point, yeah. Because a lot of times I think families... I mean, every facility has different levels by their state license, right? So you have sets of livings that have A or level mm -hmm. B, and they can only take so many residents in terms of their acuity. How long can they stay there? Mm -hmm. And right? the presence of nurses. So the skilled nursing facility might say they can stay here. They're skilled. Mm. And my question is, well, show me the tubes that are going into their body or coming out of their body. Mm. Because if they really don't need a nurse 24-7, an assisted living that has a pretty good staffing ratio is smaller, who is owned by a nurse or whatever the situation is, they can take care of that. Yeah. We don't need to go skilled. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And they can age in place well mm -hmm. there. That's true. That's yeah. Good. That's good. Other question you have a question. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So how do you approach tough conversations with families? Like I know with hospice there's stigma around it, but how do you approach conversations? Hospice, um, I would be really objective about it. I think I mentioned like I could cry if I really internalize mm. it. Yeah. But I start with when we get to this point and here are the signs and they will need hospice care. Please be open to that. I think I've said this so many, t so many times to, to the daughters and sons and loved ones, is be open to all experiences where you won't have control. Mm. And I start educating them because they have to hear the truth 
and I start speaking slow, like now, <laughs> because I want it to really sink in. And if they're not willing to listen then, then we talk about it again. Um, most of the time they're open to it, but there are also times when I say, let's say an assisted living will say, oh, they're eligible for hospice. And I said, nope. I said, don't listen to that because this person is still able to stand up and take some steps. And maybe there's a chance for a rehabilitation. So let's do PT and OT and all that. Mm -hmm. So, and I do, I just tell them the truth and I tell them nicely. And uh, I haven't had a person really say, well, you're so mean to like, no. At, at, by that point, they've already trusted me. Yeah, that's good. That it's a it's an easier conversation. Yeah. So it's almost like talking to a friend. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. But there's also like I get into a stoic mode too. <laughs> <laughs> Clinical sometimes, what yeah. I call it. Yeah. Um, but there's all these pauses, right? I think the society is so scared of pauses and mm. those awkward silence. And it's in those awkward silence that you're really giving them a space to think. And I say, let's talk about this again next week. And then we go back to it. So. That's good. I saw, I just saw your website. <laughs> I saw it said that your journey was really like impacted by you yourself having to go through it with another family in another country mm. and also the pandemic. What, can you go more in depth, like what things you saw that needed fixing, especially during the pandemic when it comes to senior housing? Yeah, so that was the reason why I, I left my old job. Mm. <laughs> my uh, mom went into a terminal illness and we had to coordinate hospice ourselves. So the city did not have hospice. Um, this, this was in the Philippines. And she went back to retire and she had a comfortable lifestyle. We had like, I think, eight hospitals in the city, and mm. she even like would go to another island to get her MRI and CT scan, wow. get a second opinion, third opinion, and all that. Um, but after all that, I kind of knew that she was dying, right? When it was time to take her um, from ICU to her home, she wanted to die at home. This is another reason why I'm a proponent of staying home, is if mm. the loved one wants to police, you know, respect them, right? Mm. So um, took her home and I didn't realize, like I was asking the doctor, so like who administers your hospice? He's like, we, we don't have that here. And my eyes just got that big, mm. like, what do I do? Well, you you know, I've decided to continue her IV for a little bit. So we had to buy the IV, we had to buy oxygen tanks. Um, wow. We had to coordinate the 24 seven nurses and she was, an hour from the city, there were no nurses around. So we had to pay more for the nurses to come. I mean, it was so cumbersome that I wasn't able to grieve much mm. until I got back. And I just thought there are families out there that are going through some difficulty, maybe not to that extent, but still it's hard to watch a person kind of go downhill, yeah, right? Yeah. Person you love and um, we weren't prepared for that. And so when I came back, I wanted to help in, in some ways. And then uh, it was a franchise broker introduced me to this industry. And I thought, yeah, I don't have to have um, a physical building. I can work with families. And frankly, I was tired of being at the desk anyway. Mm. I just thought it would be fun to tour families around, um, which now, you know, I still love. I love mm. working with families. Wow. Thank you for asking me that yeah, question. Yeah, it's, I, I really wasn't thinking about that, but that's my why. Mm. It really was my mom. And every time, you know, I still cry with my clients if, mm. if I feel like it, I still put myself in their shoes because yeah. it doesn't matter if you've seen it a hundredth time, it's their first time. It is, yeah, that's a good, yeah, good question. <laughs> <laughs> so when you sit down with the family, and they're trying to decide on a facility for their loved one, do you help them with understanding the ratios from for nurses to patients for mm -hmm. each facility? Yes, um, the, it changes all the time. That's a really great question because mm -hmm. I ask those when we go visit. Mm -hmm. 
and it changes because of their senses. Sometimes if they're full, um, this, this, the ratio actually uh, gets worse. Because mm. if you have like some, something that's 98% full, but they've only added a couple caregivers, now they're taking care of 15 to one, right? One caregiver, mm. 15. Whereas if their ratio is 60, but then it's more of a one to 10 ratio, that's, that's great. Um, and I love smaller assisted living for those who have who are needing more care because mm. um, their response times fast. Mm. Um, and they, they might say the response time is four minutes, but in reality, if somebody's giving somebody a bath, that's going to be a while, and then they press the button and yeah. they, they're not going to be there in four minutes. Mm. So I tell the families that after the tour. Um, because, you know, as, as salespeople, you, you know the standards of care, but the reality is that may not happen all the time. Yeah. So yeah. they expect, uh, expectations is a big thing, by mm -hmm. the way. We, when you talk about like the budget and all of that, it's like, well, this only costs this much, but your expectation is not going to be gourmet meals, mm -hmm. you know, not caviar, happy hour and <laughs> things. So, good, good so you're kind of like leading these seniors and their families. How do you reassure them that you're, I don't know, like, how do you reassure them that it's going to go well? It's not like a product where it's like mm. they can try it out and like return it or something like that. Yeah. Mm, so how do you like reassure them you're like giving them the best option? My favorite phrase, sentence, um, right before I give them the options is, I can't give you a perfect place. There is no perfect place. In fact, if your dad stays with you, it's not going to be perfect. Mm. You don't have grab bars in you. You don't have zero depth showers. You don't, you know, you don't have the socialization you can give because you're still working. So there is no perfect place. Um, what I assure them is that, and I've had to do this, is I will be an advocate for your dad. And if something happens... You know, it's not like, let's go find another assistant because that is not my job. Hmm. My job is to find the best, safest place. My job is not to move people around. Hmm. <laughs> so when we find that and if there is a problem, we talk about it. Uh, most of the time, things can be fixed. Um, and I had one client, he just passed away. And, you know, the daughter was ready to pull him out because there were so many like, she thought of it as service failures. Service failures happen. Let's talk about it. So we had an advocacy meeting mm. with the executive director and the director of nursing and the daughter, and he stayed there until he passed. So mm. again, there were still like little issues, um, but things are workable, mm. right? And we're all just people. I tell them the caregiver who takes care of your dad is a wonderful person. That's that's the most important yeah. thing. How they squeeze the bottle a certain way or mix their food up a little bit. It's that's that we can worry about that sure. kind of later, but he sees a very caring person. Mm -hmm. So let's pick the battles there. Mm -hmm. That's a yeah. good point. That's a really good mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Oh, it's like they always say, like when you're house hunting, there's no perfect home to you have kind of make a compromise. Okay, if it's a garage facing the forward or backwards facing, or exactly, you can't, unless you build your own, even when you build your own home, I guess you still have to, yeah, there's some things you're not going to always get. Yeah, that's a good point. A and good. I was such a, a picky customer, mm. we looked at 26 homes <laughs> <laughs> that I am so aware of it. Yeah. It's like I'm just like, I, I love thinkers, you yeah. know, because I was a thinker and it's like, I've got to check all the boxes. Yeah, and yeah. so when they come to me, I'm going, I have a thinker. Yeah. Yeah. This is how hard I'm going to have to work. Yeah. You I, know and I already. love a challenge, you yeah. know. And you know already when you see them, like, oh boy, I got my work cut out for me. <laughs> yes. And I'm not easily a person who's, I mean, I, I don't easily give up. So, yeah. I'm there for them, you know, through thick and thin. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, how can people reach you? How can people find you if they mm -hmm. need help or they need senior servicing help as well? Uh, carepatrol.com. Cool. Um, and if they're in the Northeast Dallas area, I'm here. Um, there are six owners in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and there's over 200 owners. For those of you who get to watch this um, outside of the mm -hmm. Dallas area, because... 
Uh, we do share this everywhere in the United mm. States, so uh, mm -hmm. Care Patrol's everywhere and in Canada. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's thank cool. you. Well, thank you, Amadita, for helping out. We appreciate you. Thank you so you. much. Yeah. Well, this is a great opportunity. Yeah. I love your company mm -hmm. and you're doing good work. Yeah. Oh, we try. We try. <laughs> good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.